I mean, everybody, I think, in every position is about to lose money. We've had this really complicated macro situation where we had supply chain shocks, which was people can get factories and ships sorted out because people were still in lockdown with COVID. There was a massive backlog of orders. And this filtered through. And that raised prices because everyone... You know, if, if there's a shortage of goods, if you pay more, you get the goods, right? So that rises, that puts prices up. Then we start to see issues in the commodity sector that have underinvested. So everybody comes online again, everybody wants oil, gas, everything else. So commodity prices start exploding. Then we add on a Russia Ukraine war and the penalties on Russia, and that takes a bunch of commodities out of the market. So now we're in this perfect storm of prices rising. But people have also scrambling, like all of us, probably you guys as well, to try and hire people. So we're all bidding up wages. But wages, outside of some jobs, aren't rising as much as prices. So what we've got is this situation where wages have gone up, let's say, 4.5%, and prices have risen 8.5%. So everyone's taken a 4.5% or 4% haircut in their net worth. Now that hit crypto. It started as soon as inflation happened because if you think of crypto as a groundswell movement, basically the dollar cost averaging by average people who are in the space had started drying up and we saw all the on-chain activity basically flatten out. And we've been in this sideways sloppy range because we've seen no network growth across the entire ecosystem. But so that slowed down there, but we still had that kind of after effects of stimulus, people coming online, so economies were growing but it now looks like all the forward-looking indicators are starting to roll over and start to show recession because you've basically given everybody a income haircut. So discretionary spending is going down the toilet. We're seeing it in things like restaurant spend. We've seen consumer credit going up, so people are desperately trying to borrow money to maintain their expenditure plans. We've seen mortgages go up by the most in history as a percentage. Um, I mean, they've absolutely exploded higher. We've seen two-year interest rates with the largest one-year rate of change in all recorded history. We've seen, so what we've got, if you add all of these things, and we've seen the US dollar going up fast, when you put these things together, what you've got is the fastest tightening of monetary conditions in history. And we've seen it, the big tech companies are all starting to lay off staff. They're all like, holy shit, even Amazon said we're overstaffed. So we've completely turned the economy from, oh, great, we're coming out of recession from the pandemic to, oh, my God, we're going straight back into recession. The market's tightened before the Fed even got around to doing it. The market did its job and it stopped economic growth dead in its tracks. Europe's already in recession. China looks like it's in recession and is in lockdown again. To complicate the picture, we don't know what that means for supply chains. So we might have these, I think inflation falls and I think the Fed pivot soon. It's like 2018. But 2018, the S&P was down 22%. It's only down about 15, 16 now. So I think there's more pain to come before the Fed suddenly realise that growth's gone. And the bond market will tell us that first. It always does. It will Yields will start falling, and that will be probably the signal, as we had in 2018, crypto stabilises, uh, the growth end of equity starts stabilising because they realise that some stimulus is coming. And so there's a lot, sorry, there's a lot, it's a bit of a monologue, but there's a lot to get through. Now, if inflation is still high-ish, because it's going to take a while to come down, but I think it comes down pretty fast, but let's say it's still at 5% and the economy is now headed directly into recession, what do the Fed do? Well, they're unlikely to purely stimulate because optically that doesn't look right. So my guess is they'll do what Europe's starting to do and Japan's starting to do, which is direct transfer payments that I've been talking about for a while, which is basically MMT. So I, you give money to the people who need it to cover the costs of their bills going up um, and you basically finance it by buying bonds. So I think we're going to see stimulus coming faster than people expect in certain parts of the economy. In Europe, they're doing it for corporations who've got high energy prices and they're doing it to households. Japan's doing it to households as well. So it's coming. So there's a lot. There's this transition from inflation 
to demand destruction, to stimulus, that cycle. We've just come through what's known as the Great Moderation. So the Great Moderation basically started in about 1990. And that's when we start using interest rates as the main tool to manage the economy. And so what happened is we dampened the business cycle. So as soon as the economy got too weak, we would cut rates. And then when it got too strong, um, we would raise rates. But generally the rate of interest was going down over time because of demographics and debt. But it drew out the business cycle. The cycles were longer and they were less violent. Then we started the first aftershock, which was 2008. But we still managed to moderate. Why? Because we started the use of the central bank balance sheet. That was the next thing. Then the COVID shock came, and I think it broke all of this now. So we now really don't have any interest rates. I don't know what the Fed are going to get to. Maybe they get to 2.5%. I don't know. But they're not going to get anywhere back to where they would like to have got to what's perceived normal. So we don't really have interest rates to use. And we've got the balance sheet, but we know the downside of the balance sheet. So if we go back to previous periods before the Great Moderation, the economic cycle used to be a three-year whiplash. And actually, it was better because you had a market clearing event more often. So we didn't build up the imbalances as much as we did from the Great Moderation. The Great Moderation basically meant that you could use assets as collateral for debt because they were generally all low volatile. So that the less volatile it is, the more you can borrow. This is kind of breaking some of that. So, you know, do we see a great deleveraging? Who knows? I don't think we can afford to because it's gone too far because that's the end of the entire system. So it's a, it's a really complicated picture. Um, but I think we end up with negative real interest rates ongoing, um, onward use of stimulus, uh, maybe in a more targeted approach um, because we can't allow the debt bust which is why the Fed will pivot soon. But the world is the most indebted it's ever been as a percentage of world GDP. The US is the most indebted country as a percentage of world GDP of any country in all economic history. All of that is against the collateral. So you borrow money against something. So you borrow money against your shareholdings, you borrow money against bonds, you borrow money against your house. So if you allow the price of those assets to fall too far, well, your debt gets liquidated. And we can't allow that because it's too big. I mean, these are hundreds of percent of GDP. So you basically could destroy everything. So that's why we need to be super careful. That's why the central banks panic and buy things like, if you look at the, uh, in the pandemic, they started buying mortgage bonds and they bought corporate debt. It's because if you allow that stuff to go bust, the whole system's blown up. That's nearly what happened in 2008. So they can't allow it, which is why we're in this weird mess where they keep debasing the currency because that's the only answer they've got, which is one of the reasons that we all own crypto. I think the oil market needs to break because that's the headline inflation thing that real rates have been following. And it feels like it's starting to happen now, but it needs to break a bit lower. And then, you know, if the oil market comes down to $70 or so, that's going to ease a lot of people's fears because this Russian fear is in everybody's minds, yeah, the oil market. So if that happens, I think that happens first. The dollar is helping bring down inflation. The next part is the bond market will tell us. It always does. The bond market, much like 2018, there was that final panic in 2018, in December 2018, where the equity market puked. We had higher inflation, the dollar was going up, then the oil market broke. Um, and then finally, yields started rallying. And that was the signal that the Fed were going to pivot because the bond market does the job for them. So if, if the bond market raised the rates, the bond market is going to ease them too. But it's just not got there yet. So it's very close. And I think we'll see, so far we've been seeing yields going up and equities going down. And soon we'll see equities going down and yields going down. Then we've got to the signal that we probably, that the market's going to start pricing in the other side of the cycle, which is the stimulus. So inflation is the rate of increase in prices and debasement is the devaluation of the purchasing power of a currency. What most people are observing is debasement generally, we've been observing, that doesn't affect the bond market. Does the US go into default? No. Does it increase the headline rate of inflation? No. The, the rate of inflation goes up because of what's just happened with supply chains or 
in the 2000s, it was because of China coming on the market as a demand shock. That's what really changed inflation because structurally we got this aging population and high debt. So you tend to get lower inflation over time. So I don't think it's a bond market bubble. It is a financialization bubble, i.e. a debt bubble. But I think that drives interest rates lower, not higher. Because what happens is you lower the trend rate of growth of the economy because of debt. So each dollar of debt you take out, the less increase in GDP you get for it. So that's an over leveraged economy with a bunch of old people. You can't generate that kind of thing. You can't generate that kind of growth. So I don't think that we're in a bond market bubble. I think we're in a debt bubble. That's just a different thing. You know, is the US going to default on its debts? Well, they're going to do it not by not paying them. They're going to do it by debasing the currency, which is a whole different issue. Um, and so, yeah, so I don't agree with Dan. Um, I don't think that the bond market becomes unhinged because the central bank just buys it and they just lower the value of their own currency. So Japan has been doing that. Japan has been buying its bond market to stop yields going too high. And what happens is the end collapse. So the dollar is a game of musical chairs. It is a world massively in debt in dollar terms. Most trade is done in dollars. So most borrowings are done in dollars. In fact, most of the world's lending is done by the euro dollar market, which is the offshore dollar lending markets, generally driven by the European banks, the Japanese banks, and some of the Asian banks. It's a game of musical chairs because the moment that growth slows down or growth is too fast, generally it's when growth slows down. When growth slows down, people need dollar financing and there's less dollars in the system. If the Fed are withdrawing liquidity right now, there's less dollars, so you're taking a few chairs away. First one was Sri Lanka. They're like, where's my chair? Gone. Right, and you'll see one country after another. We're now seeing China starting to devalue its currency. It's because part of their chair's been taken away. You know, one of the chairs has been taken out of the room. So that's what happens, is there's too much dollar borrowings, and in a slowdown, people need more debt and there's not enough debt being given out because the Fed are taking um, supply out of the market. In the other side, the dollar goes up. It's, the dollar's got a smile. So if the world is growing, generally the US has been the kind of leading world economy in terms of where you want to put your capital. So in a growing world, the dollar tends to do pretty well. The dollar does very well in a slow world. The dollar does terribly in a kind of muddle through reasonable growth world. Bear markets and recessions are scary. They don't feel good. You come in every day, unless you're short. And I used to always trade these from the short side, so I loved these. But now I'm kind of looking at it from the other way around, and they don't feel as good. And, you know, and I prefer the bull market. But this is how the world always plays out. Is there a structural change in the economy that means things don't recover? There is a non-zero. There is. It is not a non-zero chance, i.e. There's, there's a decent probability that we could structurally change how markets and the economy works. So that would be more scary because then you don't get to get your money back. It just kind of dwindles on the vine. Um, but generally speaking, I think that central banks and their magic bullet drives up asset prices over time. So if you remember that, just make sure you own some of those magic bullets when they come and that is owning some of these assets. So it shouldn't be scary. If you've got any cash, then you can buy more at great prices. If you haven't, then you need to make a decision is how secure is your income? That's the key to everything. Income is everything, assets are nothing. Is your income secure? If your income's secure, you just write it out. If your income's not secure, then liquidate your assets and give yourself some cash. And in that situation, a friend of mine, early on in my career, gave me the great piece of advice, which is, he who has cash in a recession is king. Because that's when you can buy everything on discount. You know, that's when you can book any restaurant you want. You can buy anything you want. So that's, that's the key. So just, if you can keep that in the back of your mind, yes, it feels scary, but maybe you can take advantage of it.